Welcome back to Grace Walk. I'm glad to have you join me today. We're talking together about one of the most important subjects that you'll ever consider in your Grace Walk, and that is how we approach our Bibles. We're studying from my book, Unlock Your Bible, which is available on Amazon.com. I hope you'll get a copy and familiarize yourself with the content of the book because that's what we're talking about right here. And there are certain things that are so important to understand when we come to the Scripture. And in our last teaching together, I concluded the teaching by kind of leaving you hanging by telling you that there is one thing that is of the utmost importance to understand in order to rightly interpret, rightly divide what the Bible says. And by the way, did you notice the way the Scripture says that? The Scripture says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed or embarrassed is the actual word. A lot of people in embarrass themselves. They don't even know to be embarrassed, but they do. It's an embarrassment to see they interpret the Scripture because of the lun lunacy, because of the fanatical strangeness. I mean, you've got, you've got groups that are, uh, for instance, I I'm thinking of that church that uh, is known for their racism, who uses the Bible continually, cult groups that use the Bible. It's an embarrassment. But the Scripture says study to show yourself approved, equipped, so that you won't be embarrassed and you won't be an embarrassment to the Scripture and its intent. And then it says rightly dividing the word of truth. Dividing. Well, there's, there's a hint right there. Now, I said when we began this series that there were a number of questions that we are going to consider together. And the first thing that we're going to look, look at and, and, and talk about is which half of the Bible we're reading. This is the first chapter in the book, Unlock Your Bible. So I said there's a simple truth that will transform your understanding. What is this simple truth? What is this key to which I refer in rightly dividing the Scripture? Well, it is this. We must read the entire Bible through a New Testament lens. Let me say it again. We need to read the whole Bible through the lens of the New Testament. To put it simply, we need to read the Bible with our grace eyes instead of through the lens of Old Testament legalism. I did that very thing for so long. I would even teach how to live based on things in the Old Testament. Now what you're going to see, and I'll give you a glimpse of where we're going in this series of teachings together. What you're going to see later on is that we don't really even live by the Bible. The Bible points us to the person of Christ. And I'll, you may hear me, you will hear me reference back to this again later. But you don't live by the Bible, you live by the life of Christ. Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Christ in me, Christ through me. That is what this life in grace is about. The Bible points us to him, and I'll say more about it, but if you try to live by the teachings of the Scripture, you will find yourself lost in the woods in short order. For instance, if what part of the Bible are you going to exactly apply and say, well, I'm going to try to live by what the Bible says? Well, the, the Old Testament says things like that um, you should not wear two kinds of material in the same garment. That's in Leviticus. You can't wear cotton and wool together. This is in Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, the Bible says that um, you should not plant two different kinds of seeds in the same field. So if you've ever had a garden and you had beans and corn together, then you broke that teaching in the book of Leviticus. I mean, the Old Testament says if you have a rebellious son who will not behave, you are to take that son out to the edge of the city limits at the gate where the elders will help you stone him to death. Well, there were times when my four kids were teenagers. <laughs> that that one didn't seem so far-fetched. Okay, I exaggerate, but if you have teens, you know what I mean. But you don't live by that. Or you come over into the New Testament, and we're going to talk in depth about this. So again, some of this I'm, I will repeat, but more ex extensively when we get to it. 
You don't even live specifically. You don't build your life around a verbatim verse of what the Bible says, even in the New Testament. Now, I know this makes you nervous if you've been grown up to worship your Bible, but I'm telling you the Bible is inspired by God and is profitable. The Scripture says that, and it is, but it points you to Jesus Christ. Do you, do you literally pluck out your eye? Jesus said to. If you look at a person with lust, do you literally pluck out your eyeball? Do you literally cut your hand off if you've stolen? You see, the, uh, this, this is the thing that we're going to talk about. It's how to rightly understand it. But if you've been indoctrinated into a literalism that causes you to read all of the Bible the same, then you don't recognize the difference in the old and new covenant and you won't recognize how that you are to interpret your Bible through the, lens, the Christological lens, the lens of Christ. We'll get to that later. But let's start at the kindergarten level, which is to say that there is an old and new covenant. What does it mean to, to, to read the Bible in grace? Well, our approach to the Scripture can bring us to its content with a grace perspective or a law perspective. One or the other. But I'll tell you what's very common in the 21st century evangelical church world. It's that it's a combination of the two. People are blending law and grace together. And I'll tell you what, that ruins the truth. They bring a legalistic approach and they call it a grace approach, but grace won't mix with law. But they bring the two together in an effort to try to interpret what the Bible's meaning in what it says and there's just no way to come to a clear answer. This is why it is so important that when we read our Bibles, we are to know that your Bible is divided into a New Testament and an Old Testament, and there's good reason for that. So if you want to understand your Bible, the starting place is to know what the fact that the Bible is divided into two major sections really means. The first chapter in the book, Unlock Your Bible, is entitled, Which Half of My Bible Am I Reading? And that is the first key that we have to consider. That is the question that we must answer. Which part of your Bible are you reading? When you open your Bible, you need to determine, am I reading in the old or in the new? When you open it up, you'll see that it's laid out in a way that immediately gives you some insight as to how to interpret it because there is both an Old and New Testament. And we're going to talk about what that means when we come back. All right, so when we approach our Bible, we, if we want to properly understand it, when we open the Bible, one of the first things we notice about the way it's laid out is that there is both an Old and New Testament section, both of them, and they're both very important. The choice to make that division wasn't just an editor's arbitrary decision to insert a break in the middle of the Bible story that... You know, indicated an intermission of some sorts. I mean, there was a 400-year period of time between uh, in that intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew, but that division between the Old and New Testament has tremendous significance, and it greatly affects how we understand the meaning of the Bible. These two testaments show a monumental shift in how man would understand and relate to God. I said to you before that a flat reading of the Scripture will cause you to read Old Testament Scripture and New Testament Scripture through the same lens. But that will lead you to being lost and not knowing how to find your way to where you want to get. We don't live under the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot. And when you understand that, it's going to change the way you relate to God and the way you understand the Bible. 
Let's talk about the word testament for just a minute. A person's last will and testament refers to his or her final intentions and commitments to the people who are left behind once the one that wrote the testament or the will dies. A last will and testament. It is the written affirmation of what he intends those with whom he has had a relationship to know and to possess upon his death. It's a will because it expresses the intentions of the author, the one that wrote it. It is a testament because it sets forth the evidence of her love toward the benefactors that are named in the will. There are times in a person's life when she might write her last will and testament more than once. Right? What happens? What happens when that takes place? A, a, a mother or wife writes her will and then later she decides to rewrite, update, add, add a codicil, change her will. What happens when she writes a new will? Which one do you defer to? Well, if she writes a new will, a new will and testament, the new one always becomes the prevailing document. And the old one becomes obsolete. There might be information in the old will that the family members find interesting and maybe they'll even find it helpful when it comes to understanding what their loved one was thinking at that time. But at the end of it all, the new will is what carries the authority. That's what speaks to the, the writer's final commitments to those she loved. Now, do you see the comparison I'm already trying to get to, to, to establish here? The Old Testament in the Scripture was a covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. It was His agreement with the Jewish nation about the relationship that He and they shared together. And while there were many benefits that can be realized by those who aren't Jews, which if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Everybody who's not a Jew is a Gentile. File that away in case you don't know it already. The only people that are not Gentiles are Jews. Everybody else is a Gentile. So when you come to the Old Testament Scripture, yes, there are some things there that might help you in the Old Testament. They will help you. There's a lot there that can help you. But it's important to remember that those things in the Old Testament were not addressed to us. They were given to the Jewish people. So you, you come back, for instance, to the law in the Old Testament. We know that the law is biblical. I hear people sometimes say, we need to get back to the law of God. I saw a billboard in town on the interstate one time. It said, America needs to return to the law of God. But now wait a minute. Let's be careful. Let's rightly divide the word of Scripture. Let's interpret it properly. The question arises when we come to the matter of the law that God gave to Moses and all the other laws afterward, for whom was the law given? That's a key. For whom was the law given? Speaking of the Old Testament laws, you want to hear what the Bible says about it? Here's what the scripture says about who received the law. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 46, look at it carefully. Look at your Bible. Here it is. Look at it on the screen. These are the statutes, the ordinances, and the laws that the Lord gave between, look at this, Himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Do you see what that verse says? Look at it. 
The prophet Moses was the lawgiver who brought the law down from Mount Sinai. To whom were these laws given? To the Jewish people. The verse plainly shows and says clearly that it was given to the children of Israel. Now I know we've, I've said there are different ways we can all interpret and understand the text, but that's pretty clear, isn't it? The laws that he gave to the children of Israel. Well, how about this verse? I think this clarifies it even more, this passage in Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20. Look at this one. He tells these words to Jacob, that's Israel, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. Now look at the next part of this text in the Bible. He did not do so to any nation. Now let, 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 let me pause for a minute and let that sink in with you. We've just seen that the scripture says God gave his law to Israel, to the Jewish people. For whom is the law given? That's the question. And then this text that we've just read says that he didn't do this with any other nation. Now again, look at your Bible. And I understand, I understand that when I talk this way that it may contradict what you believed. It could be something different from what you've heard in church. But I'm showing you this in the Bible. Are you willing to have your mind changed? This is what repentance means, by the way. Are you willing to repent? Are you willing to change your mind? Are you willing to see it in a different way and understand it in a way that's different from what you were taught? I've shown you in the text. The Bible says the law was given to Israel and only Israel. We're going to talk in just a moment after the break about what this means for us in particular. We'll be right back. It's amazing how the Bible can mess up doctrine that we have believed for so long. <laughs> the Bible. I've shown you two texts in Scripture that clearly show and teach that the law of the Old Testament was not given to Gentile people. We saw that it was given to Israel, to the children of Israel. In fact, the verse in Psalms that we read specifically says that the law was not for any other nation. It was for Jewish people. Now, are you a Jew or are you a Gentile? If you're a Jew, then I would have one discussion and we'll talk about it. But if you're a Gentile, what this means for us in particular is that the Gentiles, anybody who is not a Jew, was never given the law. Think about that. You were never given the law. How many times have you heard it at church said, we're not under the law anymore? I've said it because I didn't know better. I've, I've said, we're not under the law anymore. Well, I've just shown you from the Bible that we never were. We were never meant to live under the law as these verses clearly indicate. Now again, that's not to suggest that you won't find many encouraging things there because you can, but it is important to remember that while the Old Testament content might be helpful for you, it was not written to you. So, the Bible is divided into two parts, the Old and New Testament. So when you come to the Old Testament, be careful. Don't go into your Old Testament without taking Jesus with you. It's a dangerous place to be if you don't take Jesus with you. Don't go there and read it through the eyes of an Old Testament Jew under an Old Covenant because that's not you. The Apostle Paul, the great Apostle of Grace wrote these words in Romans chapter 2 verses 14 through 16. He said, For whenever Gentiles, that's you, unless you're Jewish, who do not have the law, wait, stop there, what? Gentiles who do not have the law 
No, why don't we have it? Because God never gave it to us. He gave it to the Jews. We just saw that in Scripture. For these Gentiles then who do not have the law, he goes on to say, do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law, are a law unto themselves. Twice in one passage, Paul reiterates the fact that Gentiles do not have the law. He really makes this point perfectly clear for us. So, when it comes to studying and reading your Bible, our first responsibility when we approach the Bible is to make this distinction between the two testaments. The testament of law and the testament of grace. They cannot be mixed and preachers do it all the time to the detriment of those who listen. They cannot be harmonized. As Paul the Apostle said in the New Testament, it is either law or grace. It cannot be both. The difference between law and grace is indeed a great divide. You put your finger on a random verse in the Old Testament the way that I talked about I used to do when I was a young guy and you'll likely find yourself getting nervous about what you read. And the reason for that is because there are a lot of verses there that God warned Israel about when He told them judgment was coming based on their disobedience to Him. The testament that God had with Israel was based on a mutual understanding and performance of its conditions. Back then, God had a covenant with Israel. And they had to live up to their part of it. But no sooner had Moses come down from the mountain at Sinai than God had to tell him the people, to, uh, uh, told him to tell the people, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. You see what he told them to tell Israel. Not you. Paul the Apostle has a new message for us. You don't live under the old covenant. You live under the new covenant. Notice that the covenant that God made with Israel was a two-sided covenant between Him and them. You're not under that covenant anymore. I'm going to stop at that point and we'll pick up with that in our next teaching. But I want you to let this sink in. Ask the Spirit to show you the truth of this, that you're not under that Old Testament covenant anymore. You never were under the law. If this intrigues you and you want to do more, I do teach online every day of the week, Monday through Friday. And twice a week, I do a live Zoom meeting. So if you're watching this on TV and you want to interact with me live time and, and have your questions answered, go to gracewalkexperience.com. It's a private a group that I have there. You can go there and find out how to join the movement if you like the message and I'll meet you online and we'll say more about it there. Go more into more depth. Until we meet again next time here on Grace Walk, may God continue to bless you in your own journey as you go forward. I'll see you then.